Welcome to lecture two. So I looked over how much material I have, and it's about five hours worth. Um, so I'm going to talk really, really fast. Okay, that's a joke. Um, we'll get as far as we can. Hopefully, you'll pick up two really, really important, um, important sort of mathematical techniques. So let me start with an equation I wrote down yesterday. So this is a leaky integrating fire neuron. So voltage on, voltage on neuron I minus um, leak reverts potential. So basically what this says, if, if neurons are left to their own devices, they'll relax back to some memory potential. This is about 10 milliseconds. Um, and their input is sum on j of wij, gj of t. So these are spikes from other neurons. And then, um, and this is of course the connection strength, the weights. And we're gonna add to this, from, to this um, external input. So let's call it I, I, external. And these of course are also spike trains. Um, and of course, this is a leaky integrating fine neuron, so the memory goes above some threshold that emits a spike, okay? So this is a, not a bad model of the brain. It's got spikes, it's got uh, sort of uh, characteristic for neurons, which they have, they have a really short temporal memory. Me neurons only remember things about 10, 10 and 20 milliseconds back. Um, they try to decay to some resp resting potential, which is about minus 50 millivolts. And then so V um, greater than or greater than equal to say minus, sorry, this is minus 65. This sits here around minus 65 millivolts and when we agree equal to minus 50 millivolts, you made a spike and reset to minus 50, sorry to minus 65. And remember GJ of T looks like this. So these are spike times, this is time. These are spike times. And every time a neuron spikes, this jumps up by a little bit. Jumps up, jumps up, some shape or other. So on. Okay. So this is a neural network. This is kind of what we know about them. Um, and it would be really nice to know their input output function. So it'd be really nice to know if, you know, I can tell you something about the input, uh, you'll tell me something about the output. And the idea then, since it's, um, if all goes well, uh, neurons are divided into many networks or sort of our view of the brain is that um, there are lots of different areas. And if you can understand something qualitatively or quantitatively about the input output function of these areas, we would know a lot. We still would have no idea how it worked, but remember, so yesterday, uh, when I talked two days ago, I said, um, networks aren't really human understandable. That's probably true, but we can understand things about them. Okay, we can't understand a specific transformation they could do, but we can understand kind of how they work. So this is in the category of gain insight into networks of spiky neurons. It's also, we would love to get rid of spikes. So if you ever done analysis with spikes, it's a complete pain in the ass, just because they don't happen very often. So they're highly nonlinear, uh, very noisy. If we could replace spiking networks by rate, neuron, rate neurons, for which we have an analog rate, um, at least from an analytic point of view, that would be really, really nice, okay? So our goal, which we're not gonna get to today, is, so input, this is I, I, external. 
which consists of lots of different um, neurons. All of these are all spiky neurons, right? We have in here a semi-current network. These connect to these neurons. And then we these basically there's some output neurons. But in fact, we're gonna ask, you know, what's the activity on every neuron? On neurons in the network. Okay, um, so you'll notice that the key, the key sort of the, the key hard term in here is this one. So I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about that. Um, in fact, although this is what I wanna do, I'm gonna mainly ignore external input and the reason for that is we want to understand how external input affects the network. We need to know, understand how the network works without external input. If I were designing a brain, um, if I were designing a brain, I would basically, so go back to here, um, I would design it so that when there's no input, the network is just dead quiet. Turns out the brain had other ideas. When there's no input, the network is firing away. Sorry about the call. Um, so we really want to understand this activity, this network in the absence of it. Okay, so that's the goal for, goal, for, goal for today. Was there a question? Okay. And again, what we're going to focus on is, is for at least for a while, um, is this term here, the synaptic input. And the first thing I'm going to do is change that a little bit. I'm gonna write it, um, so we have this term, this is recurrent connectivity. So I wrote this as a sum on J of W, I, J, T, J, F, T. I'm gonna assume they're N neurons and they're all tall connected. Um, and I divide this by root n, and you'll see why in just a second. And I'm gonna make this term completely random. So WIJ is just pulled from some probability distribution independently IID. So WIJ, some, some distribution P of WIJ, just some distribution P of W, okay? Um, now, totally random networks aren't that interesting, you would think. Turns out they're, they're surprisingly hard to analyze. Um, but we ultimately want our interest in the structure. In fact, I would, if I had an extra four hours, I would talk about structure. Um, but if we think about what structure looks like, it turns out it has a form like this. One over N, sum on mu, of A, I, U, B. Well, we think it has a form kind of like this. Um, not sure what, how much you've read about, heard about neural networks, especially recurrent networks. So P is typically, P is, is typically much less than N. Um, and so why, why this particular, um, Why this particular form? Okay, so, so it has to do with, with so the idea is that um, if GJ is proportional to BI for some mu, then this, this last term, one over N, uh, the sum on mu, AI, mu, BI, mu, we'll put in, Actually, a J here. Um, sorry. Uh, B J new. So, so B I mu sum on n is also a sum on 
Saman J. Saman J of B I mu B B J nu B J nu. This is the mu equals nu term for the one over n. So that's order one. Let me talk about orders all the time. So n is n is large because this is a neural network as much greater than one. So really, really, really care about how things scale with n. Okay. So when g is lined up with one of these vectors, this term is big, right? And the whole term, so we can write this as um, one over sum on mu not equal to nu of a i mu one over n sum on j of b j mu b j nu plus um, a i nu one over n to sum on j b j nu. And this quantity here is order one. Okay. So quiz number one, how big is, if, B, if BJ new and um, if, so this term, the mu term and the new term were, are uncorrelated, how big is this term? Anybody know? Anybody wanna guess? No takers. Um, <clears throat> Well, there's a taker. So, so the question is why does the scale as like one over n instead of just one over square root of n or what? Well, so the, the g's, I mean, so, so I was I haven't given you all the information. So the b's are zero mean. So we're adding together a bunch of, so we're adding together um, n uncorrelated uh, zero mean random variables. Do you know what we get? Yeah. Uh, yeah? Yeah, I got it, but I have no clue. Okay, it's one over root n. Yeah. I'm gonna actually spend a lot of time on the scaling. And that's basically, I'm actually, well, I'll come back to that. That's one over root n, this is order one. Um, and this term is actually, so, um, I'm actually going to show that on the next page. So if you have, this is something you guys need to know inside and out. If you have one over n, the sum on i of squiggle i. So squiggle i, the mean value of squiggle i is equal to zero. These are zero mean random variables. Um, squiggle i, squiggle j is equal to sigma squared delta ij. So these are uncorrelated zero mean random variables about as simple as you can get. On average, one over n the sum on i of squiggle i equals one over n the sum on i, average of squiggle i equals zero. Okay, this is just a central limit theorem stuff, although we don't really care about the fact that it's Gaussian. It's zero on average, what about when we square it? So one over n, the sum on i of squiggle i squared is one over n squared, the sum on i j of average of squiggle i squiggle j. And if i not, is not equal to j, you get nothing, right? So this is one over n squared the sum on i of average of squiggle i squared. So every one of these terms is sigma squared and there are n of them, so we just get sigma squared over n, okay? So this quantity here, give it a big X, the mean value of X is zero and its variance scales is one over n. So um, X equals one over n, the sum on i of squiggle i um, equals basically sigma over root n times some zero mean unit variance. And it turns out to be Gaussian. OK. 
okay? So the average of n uncorrelated zero mean random variables is small, is order root n. Okay, I want that to be burned into your memories because it's critical for what I'm gonna say. Okay. Um, so let's go back to this. So this term was one over n. These are one over n times random variables, get one over root n. So we can kind of ignore this, right? When g is proportional to b, we get something out, right? That's, that's sort of structured and correlated. What about over here? We're adding up, um, if G is assuming W is, uh, is random, no matter what G you put here, you're adding up N random variables, but you're dividing by root N instead of N. So no matter what this term is gonna be, oops. This term is gonna be order one. Okay, and it's gonna be basically noise. So it's kind of interesting if you have random connectivity, um, which the brain apparently has, it's basically always gonna be kind of big. Assuming the W is, is zero mean, um, we'll get to the non-zero mean case in a while. And it interacts with, this is a structure term. This is a part of the connectivity that actually does something useful. And that structured part is gonna interact strongly with the noise, okay? Um, if on the other hand, so this is take home lesson number one. You have a, there, we assume that there's some random component to your connectivity in your brain just because of biology, there's always randomness. The structured part looks something like this. We don't know for sure, but it's a reasonable guess. And what the structured part does is pick out particular inputs and in some sense amplifies them and shuts off everything else, okay? Um, and so there's one more thing we need to know. So if, if GJ um, is not proportional to BJ new or any new, then we can ignore this term. That allows us to ignore structure. Okay. So, and what we're gonna do as a first pass is assume that it's that you have some network with some structure in it maybe, but the structure is really not having any effect because none of the inputs are really ever lined up. Okay, so we're in this regime. We have a structured, part to our network, but the structured part is not being used. So we're going to, just gonna consider what seems like a sort of a strangely bizarre, easily problem, sort of easy problem is we're gonna get rid of that. Okay. And it's, it's, this is pretty important. So a lot just went on. The logic of getting rid of that is that if GJ is not sort of it's not lined up to take advantage of this particular B, it doesn't play a big role. It doesn't play a big role because of this fact, that uncorrelated random variables, um, average uncorrelated random, random variables is small, okay? Um, and so what we're gonna do is consider just this term. So our goal now is to basically, we're gonna consider a network that looks like this. Um, Tau, D, V, I, D, T equals minus. Doesn't really matter what we put here. D leak plus the sum on J, one over N, root N. You'll see why we put a root N there in a while. W, I, J, G, of T. Okay. And we're going to, at the back of our mind, we think of you know structured connectivity and external input. But we'll ignore for now. And like I said, if I had five more hours, I would tell you about them. Okay, we're just gonna consider this network. 
Um, so I've been talking about zero mean variables. In fact, WIJ is, so we know from, WIJ is sort of either positive mean for excitatory neurons and, and uh, negative mean for inhibitory neurons. But we're forget about excitatory inhibitory right now. We'll just assume that WIJ has some non-zero mean. So WIJ equals um, before I do that, I'm gonna do something else. Well, WIJ equals um, no, we, we're not gonna do that, that yet. Okay. The first thing we're gonna do is get rid of time. Um, so GJ, so we can think of the firing rate of neuron J is the time average, the time average of GJ of T. And this equals in the long time limit as t goes to infinity, um, the integral zero to t dt tj of t. Um, sorry. So we're going to. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually. Oops. We take gj of t and replace it by its time average, average over time, plus fluctuations around those time averages. Okay. And it's kind of, we're going to choose gj of t. So this is, um, this is the definition of the time average. We'll take limit as t get is very large. And remember, Um, the sum on K of GJ of T minus TJK. So this is K spike on neuron J. And GJ, I'm gonna call this GJ, um, and GJ looks like this. So this is T equals zero. It goes up and it comes down. And we're going to find it so that area equals one. In that case, this thing just counts spikes. Once we do the integral, this is just N J of T. Capital T equals number presynaptic spikes. Time T. So we have average value of GJ bar is equal to NJ of T over T. And that by definition is fine, right? Okay. So we've basically chosen normalization so that um, this term here is, this is just new J, okay? So we have tau dBi dt equals minus V I minus E leak plus the sum on J one over N W I J new J of T plus one over root N sum on J W I J delta G J of T. So these are just, these are fluctuations, temporal fluctuations. Okay, so what's this mean as far as the neurons firing goes? Um, if we plot voltage on this axis, we'll put this is minus 50 
and this is minus 65. So the synaptic drive is this term. This is oops, our model firing rates are fixed. So this term for, ne for neuron I, this is just a number. Okay. Um, and it's going to pr provide constant drive. Um, if you combine it with this thing, you get it's going to give you some memory potential. And so that number here is going to give you some mean. It's going to be mean, some mean value for neuron I that's determined by um, determined by the firing rates of the presynaptic cells and the weights. The fluctuations, on the other hand, this term is going to cause fluctuations. Whenever the neuron hits there, remember it fires and comes back and then fluctuates again. Okay. And the firing rates, firing rate of neuron I, new I equals some function of this gap, the function of this gap, which means it's a function of um, one over root N, sum on j of w i j u j. Okay. Now this is. Um, we'll see later on if we have time. This is a little bit of a cheat, right? Because we're acting like these fluctuations here are sort of fixed, independent of everything else. It actually turns out not to be such a bad approximation. Um, it kind of matters if there are temporal correlations in the spikes. You might have heard about that um, in other lectures, if not. But this is sort of an approximation we're going to make. So this is, this is nice in a couple of ways. One is um, we can analyze this, this equation. And the other is we've gotten rid of spikes. Basically say, look at neurons just, if they fluctuate, these fluctuations cause spikes and all we care about is the firing rate. And our goal now is given, what our goal now for the rest of the, of the well, however long I have, is to compute the firing rate of all the neurons given the weights, okay? Or given, um, so that would be one thing we might want to calculate. And what we're gonna do instead is gonna compute the distribution of firing rates given the statistics of the weights, okay? Um, now this seems like a hard problem. But we're going to take n goes to infinity. And as we all know, whenever n goes to infinity, life is much, much easier. Question? OK. So I'm going to start with a warm up problem. Um, so in real life, this is complicated by the fact that neurons are both excitatory and inhibitory. Um, but I'm going to start with a warm up problem, which neurons are all inhibitory. I think I saw. This problem worked for the first time by John Hertz many, many years ago. Um, and what we're going to write is that a new I equals some function. Actually, I'm going to use some function phi of root n mu zero minus or plus one over root n, the sum on j of w i j u j. This problem we're gonna solve. So w i j equals minus w bar, some constant, plus sigma delta w i j, where this is, um, Actually, I'm going to write it as delta Wij, where these are uncorrelated random variables. So they're uncorrelated. They're just pulled from some distribution. 
and the average there is zero. Um, and the variance of delta Wij equals sigma squared. Okay, this is all we know. So the first thing we're gonna do is, um, so one over root n, sum on j of Wij, new j equals one over root n to sum on j of two terms, minus w bar, um, new j, and then plus one over root n to sum on j of delta w i j, new j. And the first term is equal um, so minus W bar comes out. There are N terms in this sum, but we div only divide by root N. So we get a minus root N W bar um, new bar. So new bar is one over N sum on I of new I. So that's first term is kind of big, and this is why we had to have um, a root n mu here to cancel things out. What about the second term? So the second term is zero mean, but it's got a non-zero variance with respect to the index i. So for every i, we're going to get a different number, um, and we want to know the variance of this thing. So we're going to say, um, what we're going to say is one over one over root one over root n to sum on j of delta w i j nu j. We're going to call this some something called squiggle i. Squiggle i is a very is a, is a zero mean vari zero mean random variable, but every time we put in a different i, we're going to going to get a different number. So we're going to compute the variance of squiggle as one over n the sum on i of squiggle i squared. Okay. Um, any guesses as to how it scales with n? I could have a show of, uh, show of hands. Okay, so we it's sort of, you know, it's order one, order n, order one over root n. Anybody venture a guess? Should it be one? Or should be order one, right? We're adding up n random variables. Um, the average of n, n random variables, remember, scales with one over root n. Um, well, the average of n random variables scales with one over root n, but we have only one over root n in front. Okay, so it's exactly right. Um, so this is equal to one over n, uh, the sum on i, of the sum on j, of delta w i j u j squared. So sum on j, we can just sum over j and j prime. So we have the sum on j and j prime, new j, new j prime, and then one over n, the sum on i delta w i j delta w i j prime. Okay. And this quantity here is equal to sigma squared if i equals j. Um, and zero if i not is not equal to j on average. And we forgot a one over n that goes in, one over root n goes in here. So we have one over root n here. Sorry. So we have equals one over n. This one over root n, this term here got squared. Okay. Um, and so this quantity here is 
basically we only, sorry. Um, we only keep the J equal J prime, uh, J not equal to J prime. So this sum here, we only keep the sum J equals J prime. We do that, we get new J squared. So this quantity here is equal to on average, sigma squared, nu squared. Okay. Um, so what's that mean? So squiggle I, it's a zero mean random variable. Um, but for the central limit theorem, squiggle I is approximately Gaussian. There are small issues because of the correlations that, that squeak in, but squiggle I um, or P of squiggle I P to the minus squiggle I squared over two sigma squared nu squared over the square root of two pi sigma squared nu squared. Okay. So this, this quantity here, is a zero mean Gaussian random variable. So if it is a uh, use of this zero, this is zero. Zero mean and variance of sigma squared, which is variance of the weights times the second moment of the firing rate. Okay. So that's, okay, so that's nice, but why do we care? Um, so we care for the following reason. We have this equation, nu i equals some function of root n mu zero. Um, if you remember the mean value of this quantity was minus root n uh, w bar bar nu bar, okay? And this is just a, ra a Gaussian random variable with this standard deviation. The standard deviation. So we're going to write this as um, minus root n w bar nu bar. And then this is the important part. We're going to write this as sigma the square root of nu squared times zi, where this thing is normal. It's a, it's a sort of normal zero one. Unit variance, unit variance, um, zero mean unit vari variance is Gaussian random variable. So why is this nice? Because we can compute average value of nu. So the left-hand side, so what we've done is completely ignore correlations. So the idea here, so we're pretending like zi is independent of nu i. And the reason we can do that, the deep reason, to this day, I don't know quite what it is. Um, the deep reason is because this, this op will need multiplied by this random matrix. It completely scrambles any information about new J. Okay, it doesn't completely scramble it, but it pretty much for all intents and purposes, it scrambles it. So this quantity here is independent of this quantity here. Okay, this is, this is a insanely non-trivial result, um, which works really well in simulations. I've never checked exactly why it's true, but it's kind of reasonable. So what's that mean? That means new I bar, so new, so the, actually, so the right-hand side depends on the first and second moments of the firing rates, new and new squared, right? I'm using a mixed up notation. So the average value of nu to the power k is one over n, the sum on i, phi of root n, u zero minus w bar, nu bar, plus sigma, the square root if I should use better notation, um, times zi. 
Okay? And Zi is sampled from a normal distribution. So what does that mean? That means in limit of large n, we can do an integral. Integral dz, e to the minus z squared over two, over root two pi, pi to the power k, uh, root n, mu zero minus w bar, mu bar, plus sigma, the square root of mu squared, z. And for consistency, I should probably write this as u. Okay, so these, these quantities here, so this is nice. We have to do two integrals. The integral for, for k equals one, and that'll give us, for k equals one, that'll give us new bar. For k equals two, that'll give us new squared bar. Two equations, two unknowns. And once we know new bar, new squared bar, we can sample from this to get whole distribution of fine rates. Okay. So this is a kind of a mind bogglingly beautiful result. I can say that because I didn't think of that myself. Um, I'll give you guys a whole long list of references that goes back um, a long way, um, including John Hertz's book, um, which is it's still in print, it's a great book. Um, so this was really, really fast. Um, I'm going to give you guys an assignment. Why don't you spend about five or maybe, we'll see how long it takes, five or maybe 10 minutes working this out. I'm going to consider a really simple case, and it's kind of surprising. So new, so phi of all this cool stuff equals a heavy side step function. Phi of x equals theta of x equals one if x is greater than zero and zero if x. Okay. Um, so the nice thing about this is that new squared Okay, so I want you to compute. We're gonna use exactly this model. We have a mu naught. This is exactly our model. W bar or sigma, those are the parameters of the model. Um, I want you to compute the average firing rate as a function of those parameters. So I'm gonna let you guys scribble on a piece of paper for a little while. Let's just go five minutes. It's worth, it's sort of worth spending time on. Once you've done it once, it's going to be a whole lot easier. Okay, so I'll sort of stop, stop babbling and let you guys think for a little bit.
Okay. Um, I can kind of see you guys. Show of hands, how many people think they got it? Is it like <laughs> one over square root of two? I actually don't know, I'll, but I'll work it out. It's, it's, it, um, in fact, when it comes down to it, all we want to do is this integral. But because new, uh, new squared bar equals new bar, right? Because x squared, and if basically new squared equals new, because it's a step function, um, we do the integral with, um, we just replace, we replace this with new bar, which all we, we only now have one order parameter, the mean firing rate. And so our equation becomes new bar equals integral dz e to the minus z squared over two over root two pi times theta step function of root n u zero minus w bar bar sigma squared of nu bar z. And basically what this means is we integrate over z such that this whole term is greater than zero. Okay, so sigma the square root of nu z must be greater than or equal to, to greater than, must be greater than um, root n w bar nu bar. I speed mm -hmm. up. Okay, or z is greater than root n um, over sigma. So w bar, the square root of nu bar minus mu naught over the square root of nu bar. Okay, so the integral goes from, um, okay, so the integral goes from this point. Um, so, so given that, so nu equals the integral from z naught to infinity dz e to the minus z squared over two of just one, right? Mm -hmm. It is one. So this is an error function. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically phi of, it doesn't really doesn't matter, minus z naught. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, phi is a cumulant normal distribution, um, but this one, it's sort of easy, right? So nu bar, nu, equals phi of minus z naught. And for z naught, we just stuck this in here. So we still have kind of a hard problem. We have to solve for the self consistently, um, but it's not really that hard to do. Um, you should definitely, I'll give you these notes, you should definitely work it out in your own time. It's, it's kind, of, kind of interesting. Um, there's one more thing I wanna point out. Okay, so that, was that pretty much okay? We just, the observation, you know, this is an especially simple case um, when we only have to compute one integral instead of two and just notice that um, the z range of z is determined by what happens over here. Okay, and you, you get, you get a, a Gaussian integral, but that's a little bit of a detail. So there's one thing really, really important to notice about this. Um, so if you look at, so we ended up having um, new i equals phi of root n mu zero minus w bar mu bar plus sigma square root of mu squared z i, where this is normal zero one. Okay, um, and then we have, let's just take nu bar. So nu bar equals integral dz e to the minus z squared over two over two pi times all this. 
Okay. So this is a convolution. Okay. We're just smearing this. If, if I, we'll even sort of take an extreme case when we took before, if I looks like, you know, sort of like this. After the convolution, so this quantity here, this integral, all it does is smear this out a little bit. Okay, so this is integral dz e to the minus z squared over two over two pi pi of dot dot dot. Okay, the amount it smears it out scales with uh, depends on on the second moment. Okay, but the point is that a lot of our intuition is going to come from the generic shape of these game functions. Um, so the fact that it smears it out is kind of not a big deal. Um, in fact, so we can sort of almost, for qualitative understanding, we're just going to throw this away. We so replace phi by some smoothed out version of itself and throw this away, ultimately. Okay, so let's summarize the main take home points. First main take home point is this if you average some uh, zero mean uncorrelated random, Gaussian, uncorrelated random variables, you end up with something whose size is one of root n times the Gaussian random variable. So that's something you should double check about six times. It's one of the most important facts in the world. Um, the other important thing is we can is that um, we can basically take this quantity here, express it as just a, a, a random variable that's uncorrelated with this, which is obviously a big approximation. Okay, and it's rigorous in, for sparse networks. You'll actually see some, some, if you do simulations, you'll see some departures from the theory because of the weak correlations. But it turns out if this is random, it's a pretty good approximation, okay? And we can use that to develop, to actually solve equations, right? We can write this down and then because we're, and then we can find moments just by turning at sums over I into integrals over Gaussian random variables, okay? Um, so if you absorbed all that, I'll be very, very, very happy. And believe me, this shows up all the time. So I only know four tricks as a physicist, and one of them is if I see a large sum, I pretend like it's a Gaussian random variable. It works insanely well. Okay. Peter, now that you got here, can I ask you a question? Sure. So um, all this is uh, kind of a mean field approximation, but yeah. and large. And now I, I know that also in practice, we've done these things for a million times and in, we compare with simulations and it, and it works well. But I always have this nightmare that, you know, then if, you know, for finite n, the, the, the central limit theorem has corrections and and why don't they ever show up in some? I I I I imagine in in you know if you if you look at typical systems that, that uh, those those effects are not relevant, but there should be individual cases of networks that you build and these things even large, but these things you know blow up. Uh, has anybody looked into that, or is there any like reason why they are we just lucky or? Yeah, we're pretty lucky. Um, so. Uh, Couple things. If I have, so it turns out that it's really not n that matters, it's number of connections k. I mean, it's worse, it's really, it's really a bad situation. Um, and k is about a thousand in the brain. So we're talking about one of a root thousand is one thirtieth. So the first observation is we're not really even the large in limit. Yeah, I mean, it's the limit of 30 to infinity. Yeah, 30 equals infinity for large 30. It's not, um, yeah. It's... Even when I've done simulations, even when n goes to infinity, for, for, for networks like this, you'll get really good agreement with theory. If you do excitatory inhibitory neurons, which I'm about to talk about, even for large n, you see order one departures. Um, and I think it's because it's a mean field theory, this is not really Gaussian. There's some correlation filling around that we haven't dealt with. But, but do you know um, if, if, if it's possible to do like a perturbative expansion in one over n 
as I mean, with the, I mean, everything you did, you could just say that the, you know, when you approximated uh, the, all those terms with the mean and standard deviation, you can also add the, how the, the deviations from that as a function of one over K or one over N. Or so K. I tried to do that once. And the, where it's hard is that, let's go back to this quantity here. Okay, so our, our big approximation, this quantity here, our big approximation was we could use a central limit theorem. If you think about that, it's kind of insane. These firing rates are actually a function of the weights after you solve this equation, right? Exactly. This is fully correlated. This is insanely correlated variable. So yeah. I think it's- my, my nightmare comes from that you're, it, 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 for some reason they seem not to- Yeah, I mean, maybe John Hurts would know more about this than I do. Partly because if you even, because you have a scrambling effect, if this is very sparse, um, it becomes rigorously correct, but it has to be insanely sparse. Um, but it's really, I, calculating corrections, I think would be super fun. Um, I spent like a day or two trying it once and I never got, I didn't get anywhere. Because you have to look at departures from Gaussianity because of correlations. And I'm sure there's a whole field of that, which I know nothing about. It also- right. Even there is much simpler than that, that, you know, we know some tail, uh, I mean, how basically in the central limit you converge to the, um, how fast you converge to the, to the, to the Gaussian. Yeah, and so that's, I think that's known. In there you don't really need to know the correlations, but some sort of average estimate yeah, yeah. Of correlations, which is. I, I think, you know, I think you might look at moment generating functions. As John Hertz just pointed out for sparse networks, you can do belief propagation. Um, if it's really sparse, it's helpful because you're asking if, um, well, it's not obvious, but for really sparse, it's helpful. If it's sparse enough, you can show rigorously they're uncorrelated. Um, and again, I think by central, you can use uh, generating functions to look at departures from Gaussianity. Um, but there's a worse problem on that. The worst problem, of course, is it's really number of connections, not N, and that's only about a thousand. And the other problem, if you look at it, it turns out that I'm not going to have time for this. You, got, you can use it as a homework problem. Um, this quantity here, it's actually the, so you kind of want, you kind of want the sum on J, you kind of want this to be, well, well, I'll do it now. Okay, what we have, remember, is, um, one over root n, the sum on j. I'm going to put wij. I'm going to replace this by wij new j goes to one over root n. Uh, I've already seen this. Um, so when, I, when you just average this thing, it's really, really Crude goes to root n w bar nu bar. Okay. And root n is really root k, where k equals number connections per neuron. So it turns out what goes here? What goes here is, is the size of a PSP, and it's really times the membrane time constant. Membrane? No, it's not no square root. Um, there's a membrane time constant that goes in here. Time is tau, nu bar. It's a membrane time constant. Um, equals 0 0.01 seconds. Um, so if nu bar is, let's say, one hertz, this is, this quantity here is one over hundred. Okay, and then we have a third root and we have a root K in front, and this is 30. So our small parameter, which is supposed to be big as zero. So this would really, re we'd like to take the large end limit because we can make statements, strong statements. This should really be considered a really, really qualitative approximate theory. 
okay? Um, if you increase things, I'm actually, I think I might be missing a factor. But if you increase things to 10 hertz, then even 10 hertz, I think actually I'm missing a factor. I don't remember it being this small. Um, but, wouldn't in the balanced state help with this somehow? Well, the balanced state... By reducing the, the, the effective time scale of the... It does, but it's, you're killed by this tau factor that sits out here. I wonder if it's root it's tau. Correlation time. Yeah, yeah so it's, I've, I actually should go back to that. I, this, this seems way too small. Um, might be a square root floating around. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it, it turns out what you really want. Let me, let me get to the EI networks and we can come back to this a little bit. But really, you need firing rates new greater than, for any of this to make sense, new the greater than or equal to a few hertz, at least. So at very low firing rates, this whole theory, this theory disintegrates. Okay. Um, it's amazing how well it describes everything we, th everything we see in the brain. Um, and I think it's just a matter of, I think there's a deeper reason that nobody's actually investigated. <laughs> okay, so. From Victoria, or Victoria, are you um, raising your hand because you have a question? question? You can put it in the chat or, or relay it to uh, yes. Sir. Okay. Not really, why? Oh yeah, go ahead. I have a raised hand. Okay. Oh, sorry, that's uh, my mistake. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're running out of, so let me, um, I'm gonna save this to photos and start over because Zoom has this weird thing of only 12 whiteboards, which is bizarre. Um, we have all this memorized. I'm gonna go back and now switch to, um, excitatory inhibitory networks. Uh, and really it just, things are a little more complicated. Um, as far as the analysis goes, but we get something out of it. Um, so yeah, so how much time? I started about 10 minutes late, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll knock this off fairly quickly. Um, so there are a couple of things we want to be able to derive. Um, explain. So if you stick an electrode in the brain, you see low firing rates. Meaning on the order of say five hertz, even lower. Compared to a max, neurons can fire about hundred hertz, not for very long, but they can easily fire that. Um, you see a broad distribution of firing rates. We want to be able to explain that. You see oscillations. So if you plot the population firing rate versus time, you often see things like this, where this is on the order of, you know, 10 Hertz plus or minus. It can be much higher, 40 Hertz, 50 Hertz. Can be, but oscillations are really common. Um, and in these oscillations, E leads I. Salutary neurons. So if this is excitatory neurons, this is the firing rate of excitatory neurons, um, firing rate of inhibitory neurons follows along behind it. Okay. You see things like up down states. Where the firing rate of the population doesn't matter, it's, you know, going along and bam, it crashes. Stays down for a while then comes up, crashes. Kind of irregular. And the time scale for this is in the order of one second. And finally, you see very irregular activity. And, then, and it turns out that, that low firing rates are only really understood recently and irregular activity even more recently. Um, in the 90s, by a famous set of papers by Carl Van Vriesek and Hans Samplinski, and I'll give you those references. Okay, so these are the things we want to explain, and we want to explain it. And so 
and we're going to explain it, as Yasha pointed out, very, very approximately by making some insanely um, bad looking approximations. We assume n goes to infinity when it doesn't. All sorts of reasons that that shouldn't happen. Um, but this is things that physicists are best at. Physicists are best at making stupid approximations that give you a lot of insight. And that's what we're going to do. Okay. So we're going to start with the problem with excitatory inhibitory networks is really almost one of notation. So we have new I. We now have excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So it just becomes a mess. So phi E, our gain function of the sum on J of W, E, E, I, J. And we'll pretend like there are anexitatory inhibit inhibitory neurons, even though they have different numbers, um, but it doesn't really matter that much. Minus one over root N, sum on J of W, E, I, I, J, nu, I, J. We also have some external input, which is gonna to have to scale as H, as, um, this is our external input. Eventually we'll give this temporal dynamics, but for now we won't. So nu I, I equals phi I. And the only thing that happens is this becomes W, I, E. This becomes W, I, I. Otherwise, everything else is the same. Okay. So we're going to do, because we're now experts in suns, and so WE, um, all, these, all these weights have non zero means. So we'll write W, Q, R, I, J equals W bar Q, R plus delta W Q R I J um, Q R equals E or I. And we're gonna say this has variance sigma squared Q R. So variance, okay. Remember that's all we need. So we'll take one of these, one of these variables, one over root n, uh, the sum on J, of W, Q, R, I, J, new Q, J. And we're gonna let this go from our old, from analysis before of root N, W bar, Q, R, new bar, R, plus, uh, the square root of sigma squared QR, new squared R times Z uh, QR. And this is normal zero one. Okay. So every one of these has a mean, which is root n, which is really the square root of number of connections. So the square root of number of connections is in the right of it. All it does is give you more algebra without really adding much. Um, and so now we'll, we can write our equations as new ei equals phi e of root n w bar, oops, Actually, I can write a Q there. Neurons of type Q, W, Q, R, new R bar minus W, sorry. W, Q, E, new E bar minus W, Q, I, R, new I bar. Then we have plus um, Gaussian random variable, we have two Gaussian random variables, one from QE and one from QI, but since they're Gaussian, we can combine them and we can write um, the square root of 
sigma squared QE, nu E squared, plus sigma squared QI, nu I squared, times Z Q I, and then we have plus H, plus root N, plus root N, H, E, H, Q, I. Okay. So we have what we had before, except now we have two terms, which is good. Because the mean excitatory and the mean inhibitory drive in this model is large. It's got a root n in front of it. And the fluctuations are order one. Okay. So these terms can be used to balance everything. And all this does is smear out the gain function. It takes phi e, actually should be um, phi q, and uh, I've erased my, uh, my picture, but if phi q looks like this, um, after taking into account this term here, just like that, okay? Um, actually, I may be getting ahead of myself. So keep this in mind. So I might be getting ahead of myself. Okay. So there are a couple observations here um, that are sort of important. So we'll ignore the, the external input from now. Let's we'll pretend like, for instance, let's actually make that um, independent of I. So it doesn't cause any problems. Okay, it's just some constant external input. So where do we get our fluctuations? So if this term were small, all the firing rates would have the same size. Okay, so the root n here doesn't really matter because this is gonna cancel that, right? We could have made this bigger, but that would have made this bigger too, or we could have made this small and that would have made this small, okay? If we make this small by letting, by let's say dividing all the weights by root n, this term becomes really small and the every neuron has the same firing rates. Okay, it's kind of important point. This term here governs the spread in firing rates. And the reason we have a broad distribution of firing rates is because the weights have just the right size. Right, we could still adjust, you know, we could still adjust this. There's nothing, you know, this sigma can be anything we want, right? But the variance of the weights is just the right size, it gives nice broad spread and distribution fine rates. It's not too small, if it were too small, all of the neurons would fire at the same rate. If we're too big, um, they would they would basically either be not firing at all or, or firing at a really high rate. Okay. So this is kind of nice in some sense. This very simple theory um, explain the broad distribution of firing rates. Okay. Um, so as usual, so this, that's kind of important. As usual, um, we want to compute our, our order parameters, the average firing rates and the second moments. Um, that gives us four equations for unknowns. Okay. But let's be a little bit sloppy and say we can solve for the second moment in terms of the first. So this person, this is fixed. And now let's write down equations for the um, first moments. And we have new E or new Q bar equals, uh, remember it's one over N, the sum on I, a bunch of stuff. And that's gonna be replaced by an integral. I Q of root N, so W Q E bar, nu E bar minus W Q I bar, nu I bar, um, plus some giant square root times Z, actually. 
uh, plus external input, HQ, in the area such giant square roots of a bunch of stuff times Z, and then, oops, E to minus Z squared over two over root two pi. Again, this is just a convolution. So basically what this convolution does is smear out our gain function. It takes us from the raw gain function here. We have a raw gain function here before we start and the, this convolution's integral smears it out, okay? So we can just forget about it and write, just to get an understanding, new Q bar equals um, some smooth out gain function, which I'll fly, call fly Q tilde of root n W bar Q E new E bar minus W bar. Actually, I'm gonna do, I'll write down both equations now. New E bar, oops, W E E, um, E I, new I bar plus H E. And new I bar equals phi tilde of root n W I E bar, new I bar minus W. So these are our mean field equilibrium equations. Equations. And the derivation was about as sloppy as you can get, um, which is kind of what, what you want. Right, you want to get the most biggest bang for your buck, and you can do that if you make radical approximations, and you got to kind of cross your fingers, because um, you don't really know if 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 they're going to work until you've done simulations and you played around a lot. Um, you'd like to be more rigorous, but some things are hard. Okay, so I'm actually I'm pretty much out of time. Um, I'm going to leave it as a homework problem. So first of all, this is an equilibrium equation, right? What happens if you start off with these fine rates way too high? Then this is gonna go up. So we could just add, tack on some dynamics, tau e, DDE, subtract new EI here, tau I D D T minus new I. When we do that and go back here, we get the same thing. Tau E D D T and tau I D D T minus new E. Okay. Um, so these are dynamical equations now for the excited inhibitory firing, right? Um, I, and so it takes kind of a long time. And so basically you can do in 2D, you can do no client analysis. And when you do, you get the famous Wilson and Clowen null clients. Wilson. I'm guessing you guys will learn about something about this in this course. And they're super cool. On this axis, you put new E bar. On this axis, you put, oops, new I bar, new E bar. And you can plot. What you do is you plot a null line is when this quantity equals zero. For fix, you fix inhibitory firing rate, you ask, well, actually this, this is the firing rate for which this is zero is a curve. 
okay, in 2D space. This is also a curve in 2D space and where they intersect um, is where there's an equilibrium. And I'm gonna draw this for um, root n not so big. And you get the most, you get like pretty cool looking null clines. So this is somewhere like a hundred Hertz. And that's for the excitatory null client, inhibitory on null client looks like this. Inhibitory. It's excitatory. And you can actually, the other nice thing is you can put um, directions. So this is the new EDT. So it goes to the right there, it goes to the left here. Um, this goes down and this goes up. And so this has a single fixed point right here. Um, depending on the parameters, that can be either be, uh, stable or unstable. If it's unstable, you get oscillations. Um, and that, and basically the shape of these null clines, the fact that they're almost parallel is the reason you get oscillations, oops, and E leads I, let's see in a second. And also the shape of these null clines tells you you get no low finites, okay? And the reason E leads I is because you get curves like this. So first E goes up and then it goes down and you get oscillations like this. Okay, so um, I'm gonna send you some, so showing this would take um, easily half an hour, um, but it's something that everybody should do once. I'll send you some, a bunch of references and point out which ones you can find in Oakland. Um, it's not that hard if you've done it a million times, otherwise it's, it's kind of hard. But given that it's getting late, especially for you guys, I will stop here. Um, I'll send you these notes and tons of references. All right. Thanks. Thanks again, Peter. Thank sure. You. Thanks, Thanks, Peter. Dan. Thank you. I'll see you all in Trondheim next year. All right. <laughs> Have a nice weekend. Yeah, you too.